Perfect. Um, thank you for that intro, um, Gary. That's great. So I'm Jonathan from Markle Partnerships. Um, I'm a corporate charity partnerships specialist, um, and I've got 25 years experience. So um, I'm delighted to be here um, talking with you today, um, uh, just so that um, we get the full experience. I am also in Scotland, so I'm, I'm sat in a hotel room in Glasgow. Um, so that I can talk at an event later on. So it's great to be up here in Scotland um, with you. So um, I can see there's more people coming in the room as we speak. So one thing we'd just love to get you to do, just um, as a way of kicking off, is if in the chat, if you could just type in there, just introduce yourself, so your name and your organisation, um, and maybe you know if you like your role in there too, would be really great. So if you can just introduce yourself in chat. That would be really great, uh, just so that everybody gets a sense of who's in the room. And um, if you can keep your video on um, all the time, um, I know sometimes you need to switch it off because, you know, maybe as um, Gary said, a toddler runs in the room um, uh, or, or something's happening, then uh, feel free to do so. But if you can keep it on as much as you can, actually as a you know, presenter, somebody leading this session, it really does make a massive difference, you know, to me to see your faces coming back at me, because actually in reality, I need to, you know, sit here and get a bit of a sense as to how the content that I'm sharing lands. Um, and if you can keep your mic muted, unless you're invited to speak, that'd be really great as well. Um, is that all okay? So I think people are gonna be just sharing a bit in the chat as we go. So I'll just give you a moment to do that and then we'll get cracking. Okay, so hopefully you've all managed to say hello in the chat. So what we're gonna do today is, <clears throat> when I was preparing for this session with the uh, group from Cora, and I wanna thank, you know, just start by thanking Cora Foundation and Scottish Government for inviting me to speak here to you today, then really what I wanted to do was, I just felt like, um, Many of the people that join in this call will be either at the very early stages or not yet have started doing uh, corporate partnerships. Um, does that sound about true for where, where most of you are at? Um, so, and, and what I wanted to do was just really um, give you what I felt was going to be the five um, most important steps that you could take in order to kickstart your corporate partnerships. So what I'm going to run through over these next um, two hours is talking about um, content, running a contact mapping session, about how to identify your target prospects, about the importance of offering an exciting opportunity, and about the importance of engaging companies emotionally, and then following them up with patient persistence. So we're gonna run through those five over the next um, hour, uh, two hours, and um, we will aim also to leave a bit of time uh, for questions at the end. I am going to make this as, you know, um, as enthusiastic and inspirational as I possibly can. Um, but also we will be interacting and there will be a breakout session for you uh, to get involved in halfway through. So I hope this is going to be really enjoyable and informative for you all. So I just want you to start off. We're just going to do another thing in chat, if you can, is I just want you to write down the answer to this question. What challenges do you think companies are facing right now so i just want you to put down maybe one or two words in chat about what challenges do you think companies are facing right now you know um be it you know domestically or internationally a great way of thinking about this is a great question to ask yourself is what what problems are keeping ceos awake at night Gary, could you give me a few answers? Indeed. So we have a couple of comments coming in, Jonathan. Uh, so the cost of living pressures, yeah, uh, recruitment and staff retention, and getting staff is a, is a common one that that's actually appearing at quite yeah. a few times. Uh, cost of living is also uh, repeating itself. The funding and pressures of costs, uh, uh, also those are quite prevalent themes. I think there's an interesting one right. here: competitive marketplaces. So yeah. Um, for funds and tenders and also interestingly um working from home has affected this uh, staff. yeah yeah absolutely and how they engage with fundraising as well as well great 
So okay. Com- competition. And and one last one, I think, yeah, very interesting, Jonathan. AI is potentially a challenge. Absolutely. That- yeah, yeah, yeah. And I definitely add a couple, which would be, you know, Brexit um, and also, um, you know, the war in Ukraine or just, you know, wars per se, but certainly the war in Ukraine has caused a lot of problems for many businesses, particularly with their supply chain. But also we know with, you know, the rising cost of energy as a result. So thank you for reading those out and thank you everybody for sharing those. Well, um, I just want to ask you, so if anybody would like to share and just feel free to unmute yourself or just raise your hand and we'll get you to unmute. Um, I just want, um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a moment. When you read that list and when you hear Gary read it out, how does that make you feel? Anybody, anybody want to raise their hand to tell us about how that list makes you feel? It's the same problems that we are having. Yeah. So what's the feeling, Sheila? Mm, Busy and overwhelmed at times. Overwhelmed. Got it. Perfect. Thanks, Sheila, for sharing. Anybody else want to share how it makes you feel? It's no right or wrong answer, folks. A little bit reassuring that everybody's in the same boat. Yeah. Okay, so it's a bit reassuring as well. And I think the thing is, is, you know, part of the reason for raising it is I think it's fair to say, and I think you're you're saying the same too about your area too. I think whether you're a charity leader or, you know, a company leader right now, the market is just about as tough as it ever has been. And I think, you know, if you're a CEO, then if we look at that list, that is a really overwhelming list, um, especially if you add in things like, say, you know, challenges over equality, diversity and inclusion, challenges of ESG, the mental health crisis, like you said, hybrid working, retention. This is all very overwhelming stuff. But what I want you to get from this session is actually, if we look at it this way, I think we can also say mm, there is actually some reason for excitement. There's some reason for optimism. And now you're kind of going, this Jonathan bloke is really lost it. What's he going on about? But I think there's reason for optimism because if you think about all of those problems that companies are facing, then actually some of them are problems that a partnership with your charity can help them tackle. If they've got problems with standing out in a competitive market, then a partnership with Street League could help them do that. If they are having problems with retaining and engaging staff, then a partnership with Cruise Scotland could really help them do that. So actually, I think I want you the way, um, you know, I I want you to see all those challenges they're facing and say, yeah, okay, it depresses me. It makes me feel challenged. It makes me feel overwhelmed, exactly as Sheila says. But also I want you to, to take a deep breath And also recognize, wow, actually, this is a ton of opportunity because companies have never needed you so much. And right here in the middle of the cost of living crisis, honestly, the market for meaning and doing purposeful work has never been so great. Because as you all know, because of the causes that you tackle right here in the cost of living crisis, the need and the and the gap between those who are doing okay and those who are struggling has never been greater. A crisis shines a spotlight on need. So companies want to do something about it. Companies will feel huge benefits, but it's up to us. It's up to you. Hopefully with some stuff I'm going to share with you today to go and engage them to say, look, here I am. I'm Lena from Dyslexia Scotland or I'm Donna from Contact, and I've got a really great opportunity to help you tackle one of your biggest problems right now. So that's what we're going to talk about. Okay, so I bring you um, from the centre of Glasgow, um, 
a message of optimism. So here we go. And I think I saw that Elspeth said that's exactly the message she needs to hear. So Elspeth, I'm glad I'm on the right track. So the first one of the first step, and I can think of nothing more important. I'm probably going to say this for every step, but for this, the first step for you to run, to actually engage companies to really kickstart corporate partnerships for your charities is I recommend that you run a contact mapping session. So in some ways, that is a really complicated way of saying, I really want you to write down a list of all the companies that you know in your charity. It's a brilliant first step. It's the obvious place to start because who you know is so important. It goes down to behavioral science. Contacts matter because of a law called the law of liking. And we all are very familiar with this law of liking because it's it's happening in our lives every day. So behavioral science shows that we're more likely to buy from someone we know, like, and trust. So that means that if you have contacts at companies, they are much likely to partner with you because you will be going in and engaging them based upon a relationship that is already existing. So, um, and a really great example of this is a charity called Learning with Parents. They're not the biggest charity at all. Their turnover is round about um, the sort of £400,000 mark, and they're based in Bristol. And um, their need became greater in the pandemic as more and more parents were actually responsible for their education with their children at home. And Learning With Parents did a contact mapping session. They did a very simple session, the one I'm going to describe to you in a moment. And what they did, because they did this session, the CEO, Tom, went through his LinkedIn contacts. He went through them methodically. He said, who do I know at companies? Because Tom did what all of us do on this call. He probably went, oh, look, 90% of the people I know are in charities. So they're no good to me right now. But actually, he discovered he did have some corporate contacts. And he discovered that he actually knew somebody at IG Group. But not only he knew somebody at IG Group, but actually that he knew their CS, their um, ESG manager, so effectively CSR manager. So he went and engaged that person. In fact, with our support, we made IG Group their number one prospect. He went and engaged IG Group in the way that I'm going to describe on this call. And within two years they had secured a three-year partnership with IG Group worth £750,000. As you can imagine, for a charity whose annual turnover is about 400 k this has been a game-changing partnership. And that is all because they had a contact mapping session. So sometimes contact mapping sessions are in the that's a bit too difficult for us box but I cannot in urge you strongly enough, do one of these. Our recommended approach is it really helps to have a meeting. It really helps to pull everybody together. So what we recommend you do is invite your trustees and senior colleagues. These also could be senior volunteers as well, maybe influential volunteers, to a 30-minute meeting. Have it on a Zoom like this or on Teams or Google Meet. And at that session, ask each of them to bring at least five of their contacts who work in companies. Statistics show that every single one of us knows at least six people in companies. Because after all, if you live on a road, you're living near neighbours who work in companies. So um, all of us do have them. They just might need a bit of um, searching for. So what you do is you get them into that group, ask them to bring those contacts, ideally share them in advance. And then what you're going to do at that at, on that call is first of all, tell them why it is that you're asking them to share contacts because you want to build corporate partnerships. The second thing you're going to do with them is reassure them that you're not going to approach any of their contacts without their prior involvement or without their prior agreement because they're going to need that reinsurance. And also thirdly, what we recommend you do is get them to stay 
if any of these contacts are ones that they are particularly excited about or are particularly strong or particularly senior. And then you're away and you can begin to do the next step, which I'm going to talk to you about in a moment. So that's contact mapping. It's the place to start. It's a great place to start. And it only needs to be a half hour meeting. And we recommend doing a half hour meeting because the people you're invited to this session are super, super busy. Um, then what you can do, once you've got your contact map, then it's a great place to actually then begin to identify your target prospects. And um, you want to identify your target prospects because otherwise the challenge is, is that you're going to go completely scattergun. The challenge is with corporate partnerships, it can be very easy to just say, you know, I'm just going to fire off a few emails. I'm going to throw some mud at a wall and hope that some of it sticks. And honestly, like anything that's scattergun, folks, really that doesn't work. We recommend you identify your target prospects because it's time to ditch the really long spreadsheet of prospects and it's time to get super, super focused. So... And the method that we recommend you use, which we've developed um, at Remarkable Partnerships, is we recommend you use our five-star prospects method. So those five stars are, you've got a shared purpose, you've got a contact at the company, there it is again. They've got a problem that you can help solve, very much like we began this session. They've got resources to help solve your problem. And lastly, that they are realistic. And I'm going to go through each one of these in turn. So firstly, you're looking for a company who has a shared purpose to you. Or, you know, sometimes we use that S word, don't we? Synergy. You're looking for a company when you think about your mission and their mission. There's a bit of an overlap there. doesn't have to be a massive overlap. You don't have to be as one on everything. But you're just getting a bit of a sense that maybe there is a bit of shared purpose here. And I'm going to give you an example of one later on. The second one is that you've got a contact. And as I mentioned to you, introductions are one of the most powerful ways to secure meetings and partnerships. So ideally, you're also looking for companies where you've got contacts. That's why you do the contact mapping. Thirdly, really helpfully, is you're looking for companies who have problems that you can help solve. A bit like we were talking about earlier on. For example, you may say, look, you know, I'm Sheila at Crossreach, and I know in particular we've got ways of helping companies um, who can um, sort of help them motivate their staff, make their staff feel more engaged, make their staff feel more proud of the company that they work for. Then what you're doing is you're looking for companies who've got maybe concerns about holding on to their talent, which just about, in truth, is just about every company right now, especially those with um, skilled workforces. So um, really important, you know, the IT space, finance, it's for them, the feedback we're getting is it's more about retaining rather than recruiting right now. The fourth star is all about, I want you to think about companies who've got resources to help solve your problems. So it's not just about money, but this could be about, say, skill sharing or marketing reach or introductions to their contacts. You might have found out through contact mapping that you don't have lots and lots of corporate contacts. So maybe you want to work with some companies that can help introduce you. Now, this is where business to business companies can be really great because many companies have businesses as their clients. So they can be especially useful as helping introduce you to other companies. I find that advertising, marketing, recruitment companies are great in that way, and management consultancies. Also, it might be, and it's probably the case for most people on this call, is your charity has a bit of an awareness issue, right? So one of your greatest barriers holding you back right now is that most people have not heard of you. Well, you could go and partner with a company who has a really, really wide reach, and they could help you with that too. The key thing here is, Companies don't just like to be seen as a bank account. It feels a bit mercenary. It feels a bit singular and a bit unsophisticated. 
So what really works is to go and approach companies. Yes, of course, it can help support you financially, but of course that they can support you in other ways as well. You know, for example, you may have a problem right now with your website. There's every chance that you could go and engage a company who can help you dramatically improve your website and your web presence because many companies actually have that team built in. The last star to think about is be realistic. So, for example, HSBC receives 10,000 approaches from charities every year. I cannot tell you how many times when I've organized target prospect sessions with charities, the same companies are suggested again and again. You know, Google, Microsoft, HSBC, Lloyds Banking Group, the same ones are suggested again and again. What I want you to think about is I want you to think about that there are two oceans that I can be sailing in. There's the red ocean and there's the blue ocean. So the red ocean is where everybody else is and you're all fishing for the same fish. You're all fighting over the same fish and you're all fighting. So there's the blood of your fight in the water, which is why it's called the red ocean. It's a lovely image, isn't it, for a Tuesday morning? Uh, but anyway, that's why it's called the red ocean, because you're all fighting over the same fish. What I want you to think about is there's a blue ocean. So I want you to think about there's a blue ocean and it's full of interesting prospects that no one has heard of. You might need to search harder, but actually if you're in the blue ocean, you might be the only charity that has found this particular company. Well, certainly you're gonna be the only charity that's gonna be approaching this company with an exciting opportunity. It's much easier to win a one horse race. Um, and, you know, as a word of caution on this is, I would particularly, folks, put um, red warnings around Charity of the Year schemes. So if you think about applying for Charity of the Year, only apply for ones where you genuinely have a good chance. Otherwise, what could happen is you could waste a lot of time and resources on them. There are better and other ways to approach companies. And I'm going to talk to you about one in a moment. But here's to finish off in this five-star process. I want to give you an example of a charity, and they're a hospice based in the south of England, and they um, engage with uh, Bridges estate agents. And um, they recognised that Bridges were a brilliant prospect for them for the following five reasons. They had a great shared purpose, because they're both all about giving their clients the best quality of life. They had a contact at the company. Georgie, the corporate partnerships person there, actually knew Tony, the MD of Bridges Estate Agents. They've got problems that you can help solve. Actually, when uh, Georgie was thinking of approaching Bridges, um, she discovered that their, it was their 25th anniversary the following year. Now, if you'd have seen Bridges Marketing, you'd have realized how much they needed Phyllis Tuckwell's help. Their main marketing before they partnered with Phyllis Tuckwell Hospice was pictures of their estate agents dressed as Star Wars people with lightsabers. It was really tragic marketing. And what was great was um, Georgie was helping solve one of their big problems by walking in with a brilliant idea as to what they could do in their 25th anniversary which has helped support hospice care at home. They also had brilliant resources to help solve the problems of Phyllis Tuckle Hospice because Bridges have relationships with thousands of families across Surrey, which is absolutely the target market. So one of the things you'll want to be looking for is which companies have the same target area as us, could be target audience, but also geographical coverage as well. And lastly, they felt there was a realistic chance of success because actually Tony's father had been in the care of the hospice already. And in fact, Tony's father had sadly passed away just a few months before under the care of the hospice. So, you know, it's this bit where you're, sometimes it's even better and you know this, it's the companies where there's a direct link with your cause is even uh, makes it stronger. So. As you can imagine, um, Georgie from Phyllis Tucker Hospice approached Bridges for a partnership and she secured a three-year partnership 
worth over uh, twenty five thousand pounds, and in fact, it's still going now, and it's um, it's been worth it's raised over a hundred thousand pounds for the hospice. It's their biggest ever partnership, and there is just no way that Bridges will ever leave um, uh, Phyllis Tuckle Hospice because their fear would be that one of their other, you know, fierce estate agents in Surrey would jump in there. And the last little quirk, as you can see on their board, Bridges estate agents actually have heart-shaped um, sale boards. But there's no reason for that. There was no logic for that. But it was brilliant because Georgie went in and gave them a reason why their board should be heart-shaped to show that they're the most caring estate agent in the region. So that's five-star prospects. So, so far, you've done some contact mapping. You've identified your five-star prospects. What I'd recommend you do is ideally you're looking for about 10. Just 10 prospects is a really brilliant number. Nothing more than that. Probably 10 is enough for one person to focus on. It's all about focus and avoiding the distraction of the stuff that glitters on the end on the side of the road as you walk along. Um, the next one is really about going back to what we discussed at the beginning of the session. I inferred this. I sort of pointed towards this is right now things are really tough for companies. So actually a brilliant approach for companies is to go in and offer them an exciting partnership opportunity. So I just want to let's just go for this again. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment. I want you to answer for me. What's the one question on a company's mind when you meet with them. If they jump into a call with Drew and they meet you for the first time, what do you think is the question that's on their mind as they see you appear on screen? What's the question on their mind? Anybody wanna unmute and let us know what you think, what's the question on their mind? What can they do for us? Exactly. Who said that? Sheila. There's Sheila, that's that's great. Yeah. There's yeah, no suggestion, Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, what what is the ask going to be? Uh, is it the begging? <laughs> that well, that is that is their fear. That their fear will be, what are they going to ask me for? But actually, the real question they've got is exactly what Sheila said. The the key thing they will be asking. And this is what we do every time, actually, we join any meeting. Anytime we meet anybody, we ask that one question, which is, you know, what's in it for me? In fact, as human beings, we are what's in it for me machines. We probably ask ourselves what's in it for me about 26 times, at least every day. Somebody emails us. Somebody drops an email into Kim's inbox. She thinks, what's in it for me? Somebody calls Donna on the phone. She thinks, what's in it for me? Something comes through the letterbox. What's in it for me? Somebody jumps on a meeting. What's in it for me? Because ultimately we are, you know, interested in keeping ourselves alive and interested in keeping ourselves thriving. So the first question when you engage a company will be, will not be about, oh, I really wonder what Sheila's charity does. I hope she can tell me what year they were founded in and how many people that they help every year and how many services they run. Not at all. The main question they're going to be interested in when Sheila jumps on the call is what's in it for me. So you've got to answer that. Now, the challenge is, as has just been suggested, is when we think about how to build corporate partnerships, tra traditionally, it's been about, it's all about, asking companies for money. That's what we used to do. Well, we did used to do that. When I started doing corporate fundraising, that's exactly what we did. Back in a different century, back in around about 1998, that's exactly what we did. But it was a lot less competitive then. And they used to give us lots of money. But that's not the case anymore. Folks, if you're walking in and asking companies for money, you are working with an outdated model and it's not going to work for you. You're just going to get a little bit of go away money but nothing long-term, nothing sustainable. So I want you to recommend, I want to recommend that you stop asking companies for money and instead you totally turn it around. And instead you offer companies partnership opportunities that help solve their problems. And this is influenced by a book that I read 
quite a while ago, but I reread it in the pandemic. And it's a book I strongly recommend called The Go-Giver by Bob Berg. The Go-Giver. You can read it in a couple of sittings. And what he says is we talk so much about being a go-getter in our lives, but go-getters extract stuff from them. What go-givers do is they walk in and say, this is how I can help you. And then what you're doing is you're using another piece of behavioral science. You're using the power of reciprocity. And folks, we all know it's a long word, but we all know about reciprocity, which it means that if I give you something, first of all, for free, then you're going to want to give me something in return. And actually, you're going to want to give me probably something that's even more valuable than what I gave you in the first place. So the best way to really separate yourself out from the crowd and to really get cut through with companies is the only reason they're going to want to talk to you is if you actually, especially right now, if you have something that's really going to help them tackle one of their problems. So, and it's really important. We did some research earlier this year and we discovered the challenge is why what's holding back corporate charity partnerships is that companies and charities have a mismatch on what they're seeking out of partnerships. As you can see here in the top half of this diagram, companies really want things like delivering their ESG objectives, so environmental, social, and governance objectives. They want brand profile, as somebody else spoke out earlier on about they want to stand out from the crowd. They also want employee engagement. Whereas if you look at the main things that charities want from these partnerships, it's fundraising and increasing impact. So we potentially got a complete mismatch, which is why in many instances, partnerships in companies and charities don't work very well. They often end up being quite small and transactional. So what we recommend you do is focus on is go higher, go to the place where you can both share the same goal, which is you look at their mission and you look at your mission and you look at what's the bit in between. So when you go and present them a partnership opportunity, go and present them that opportunity based upon saying, look, you know, we've had a look at our purpose. We've had a look at your purpose. And exactly as Georgie said, you know, we both want to give people a quality of life. So that's why we're here. So look at where your synergy is and take them an opportunity. So the kind of approach that you could make for a company, we would say, for example, if you've got a contact there, you might want to start off by sending them an email saying something along the lines of, and, and Gary, I'd be happy to send this email as an attachment as well. So it's our suggested new business email. It goes something like, you know, hi, um, Peter, I'm getting in touch for two reasons. Firstly, I understand, you know, you're going to be very busy with the cost of living crisis, so I'm going to be really brief. I'm getting in touch for two reasons. Firstly, we have, um, you know, firstly, that your company and our charity have a really, really strong shared purpose, and that shared purpose is this. Secondly, I'm getting in touch because we have a partnership opportunity we believe is perfect for your company. And when it, it will help you engage your target audience through the cost of living crisis. So you'll emerge stronger. And because people will love you, your people and your customers will love you for being so purpose driven. It would be great if we could arrange a 30 minute call so I can share my idea. So I will send that over to you. Honestly, if you send emails like that to companies where you have warm contacts and you include the shared purpose, as I mentioned, you are going to get results. We had we did it with one charity, a Visible Difference charity, and they emailed a male makeup brand, a fast-growing male makeup brand, and the CEO of the makeup brand emailed back within seven minutes to say, yes, let's have a meeting. Number four of my five steps, I hope you're keeping up. I hope I'm not going too fast, um, is, and this is, I keep saying they're the most important ones, but this probably is the most important one, is engage them emotionally. I think everything in my brain, when I think about companies, makes me think I've got to engage them on business as i've just explained but yes you do need to engage them on business but the bit that we often leave out 
when we go and engage with companies is that we need to engage them emotionally. And that's the reason why, and Simon Sinek explains why here, and I recommend you read his book or watch his TED Talk. He's um, absolute genius. This is the most important thing he's ever said. People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. So people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. So if you're Sheila at Crossreach, you don't in your meeting talk about we were founded in 1872 and we helped 36,000 people, da, 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 da. Because at that stage, they're going to be begging you for mercy to stop and be quiet. Because it's really dull. Even though if you're a CEO or a leader, it's so tempting to tell them that, but they don't care. As Simon Sinek says here, what they care about is what's in your heart. Why do you do this? And the best way to engage them with why is tell them a story. And I'm sure you all know this, folks. This is because we are basically emotional beings. We buy for emotional reasons. So companies partner with charities for emotional reasons, and then they justify it with logical reasons, business reasons afterwards. So if you think about any purchasing decisions you made recently, be it small or large, on Cyber Friday or Cyber Monday or Black Friday, whatever decision you made, you made it for emotional reasons, but then you probably justified it with logical reasons to those people around you. I'm sure you'll be able to think of things like that. So therefore, your goal when you meet with a company is you want to engage them emotionally. And as charities, you have the most incredible secret weapon. Your secret weapon is your story about one person or one thing whose life has been changed. Because nothing is more powerful than a story for engaging us emotionally. And I'm gonna give you an example. And I just wanna give you a bit of a trigger warning before I tell this story. This story does involve somebody being diagnosed and having to live with um, dementia. So I wanna tell you Brian's story. So Brian, um, he left school at the age of 16 with very little qualifications. And he went to go and be an accountant. But the truth about Brian was, Brian was very, very bright. And he quickly excelled at accountancy and he joined Unilever. And he joined Unilever and he went up and up and up through the ranks until eventually towards the end of the career, his career, he was chief auditor at Unilever. And that meant he was reporting in directly to the chairman and traveling around the world, checking that Unilever's bi different businesses were on track, behaving properly and performing from a financial point of view and from an ethical point of view too. He was able to spot very quickly if a company was cooking the books, if a company was vulnerable so that he could help Unilever avoid disasters. If you met Brian, you'd find him to be one of the most interesting, fun, funny, but also sharpest people in the room. He could speak, you know, French, a bit of German, a bit of Spanish. Also, he knew some Latin. Huh. And when he retired from Unilever, he went on to go and, because he never got any qualifications, he went on to go and get a theology degree at Oxford. Because, of course, that's what you do in your retirement, right? You go and do a degree. The sad thing for Brian was that about um, two years ago, Brian started to show signs of memory loss. He started to find it harder to drive around in his car. And there was one really worrying moment um, for his family when he forgot how to find his way home in the car. And since then, he started to forget friends' names, or indeed he'll tell a story and then start telling it again five to ten minutes later, and then maybe tell it again later. And there was one moment where he even forgot, you know, the names or one of his children's names. It's been really tough on Brian 
but also incredibly tough on his wife, Pam, because it's changed her life and she now realises she cannot leave him on his own anymore. And that meant that her personal life, her social life, has pretty much come to a stop. But there is a bright spark. There is hope. Because there's an organisation called Daybreak Oxford where Brian goes twice a week on a Monday and a Tuesday for five hours. That's five hours for Pam to go off and meet her friends, five hours of respite for Pam. But also for Brian, it's incredible because he gets to meet other people like him. He feels like he's in the earlier stages than others, so he feels a little bit more lucid than others. But also he says that the best thing about these sessions is when the person at the front gets the keyboard out and starts playing music and they all sing along to the songs that he grew up to. And that's when he comes back smiling and he comes back feeling happier because of the sessions that he's running. And how come I know so much about Brian? Because Brian is my dad. How does that story make you feel, folks? Anybody? Thank you, Sam. How does that make you feel? Anybody want to unmute and talk? Have I just upset you all too much? Always seems to be me, but um, I think it's emotional, isn't it? And you connect with the story and you connect with the people and you think, you know, it, it, it could be um, anybody and um, it makes you feel emotional yeah. and hopeful at the same time. Yeah. So the whole range, really, you went, sounds like you went on a bit of a roller coaster through there. But as you said, Sheila, it made you feel a bit like, well, it could be anybody. You know, which was, you know, that's that that's that bit more than anything. It sounds like you felt, you know, empathy. Yes, Sam. Can you see me? I can. Oh, okay, that's okay. <laughs> um, I just think that um, you probably would all, as a as a company person, if I'm putting myself in their position, and this is in a meeting, and you've shared the story, I think how can I keep this going? How can I help more people? And how can I um, solve this problem? And that's obviously through fundraising or what happened. That's it. The way. Yeah. That's it. And I haven't sat there and said, hey, can you give me £20,000 to fund Daybreak for the next year? I've told you a story about one person whose life has been changed by Daybreak. And exactly as you said, Sam, what I've done is I've given you, I mean, as you, you probably all understand, right? I've made you all feel uncomfortable during that story. Is that right? You've all felt a level of, it's not an easy story to hear. It's not an easy story to tell. And there's a particular bit at the end where I just totally pull the rug from underneath your feet and you just kind of go, crap, if I cared enough, but now he's going to done that, I really can. Blimey. And there's a crucial bit here, folks, and I think, Sam, you're absolutely right. Who would have thought that the story does all the stuff that we need it to do? Because it creates that feeling like, I want to metaphorically climb over the table and just help you sit alongside you and just help you solve it. You know, Sam, I'll help you find them. You just tell me how. Because you've given me this feeling in my tummy, which I would let me call it pain, that I just need to solve right now. And this is the crucial bit, is I made you feel uncomfortable. Because what do comfortable people do, folks? What do comfortable people do? Anybody? Nothing. Nothing. Comfortable people do nothing. They do nothing. And there's so many people out there doing absolutely nothing about all of your causes. 
you know, I'm sure that every single one of you would say, I want people to, and companies in particular, to wake up and realize, I mean, you know, how about you, Scott? You know, how many people in a company are grieving? But the companies are rubbish at helping employees who are grieving, who have suffered loss. So how about getting a bit of training from an expert in crews in how to be better at supporting people with grief and, in fact, become a compassionate company? That would make you a better company. And every single one of your causes is ones where you just want to wake people up. And there's nothing more powerful than doing stories, than telling a story. It's the skill that's as old as time. It's on caves. We were telling stories back then. Just not everybody on the call can remember that. Um, but it's it it's the most powerful thing that we can do. If you do nothing else when you meet with a company, just tell them a story. And I think every single one of you inside of you knows this. The challenge is, is telling stories is a bit uncomfortable itself. It is uncomfortable. But it is the most powerful thing for us to do as um, fundraisers and as charity leaders. Leaders, This is your secret weapon, folks. Oh, and by the way, when you partner with companies, the fact that you've got emotionally engaging stories will be the most powerful thing that you can send to them as well. So they can share them on their website and show people, their employees, their customers, the impact they're making. Thank you for being so respectful and for listening to my story about my dad. Um, I get to take him to the football and give my mum a whole day's break. And it really, this is us at the restaurant before we went into the football. And it really does make me very, very happy. And what I do is I sit next to him and I, I whisper him the players' names because he I can't remember any of the players. But he says it makes all the difference. For the club that he's loved since he was, you know, a little boy growing up in Wolverhampton. We won't talk about the result last night, though, because that was daylight robbery. So here's the story suggested structure, folks. This is just like, in a way, it's just like any Hollywood movie. This is the story structure. First of all, you establish the person. Tell me a bit about them. Tell me some of the detail, like they left school at 16 years old with no qualifications. Establish a bit about them. You're going to need to give me a bit of a texture, like he was the sharp, sharpest tack in the room. He qualified to be an accountant. He made his way up through the ranks. Next, then you tell me about the problem. Establish that. The, the story became interrupted because it took a bit of a turn for the worse. You know, he started to lose his memory, couldn't find his way home, forgot the name, he forgot my name, he forgot he didn't recognise me. Then you talk about the solution. Well, thankfully, there's this incredibly charity, incredible charity called Oxford Daybreak who run a session just around the corner. So talk about the solution and now talk about the outcome about how it is for him now that it is he is actually getting that kind of support, how it is meaning that he can live better with dementia. So I want to give you all a turn. So I want to give you all a chance to practice telling a story. So this is, and we've created a safe space for you here today, a great chance for you to practice telling an emotionally engaging story about one person who your life has been impacted. And I know, Sam, at your charity, you've probably got amazing stories but not everybody is abundant in stories as say you know missing people is but um nevertheless i want you to take this moment to practice telling some stories so um i think uh gary's gonna pause the recording so i'd love to just um hear from you as to how that was doing that telling stories thing so um who would like to you know, maybe just unmute and tell us how that was for you. A chance to practice telling your story or indeed listening to other people's stories too. 
it's amazing listening to other people's stories and you can really engage and I think you learn from each other when you story tell, but it's completely overwhelming. So for me, preparation is key. Um, yeah. And and building that confidence in exactly knowing what it is I want to portray, yeah. what it is I'm going, I'm going to get across, what are my key things I want to hit, um, because you can kind of get lost in, yeah, so for me it was that preparation side. I just realised, I was like, oh, actually, <laughs> yeah, that's absolute key for me, yeah. But, yeah, but but the emotion, as long as it's an emotionally engaging thing, you know, you're going to... Um, yeah, you're going to engage them and get them, I think. So. Yeah, and I, th- I think telling a story from an emotional place does take practice, and you're right. I think in order to tell it emotionally, I can't be thinking going through about what are the details of the story. I don't want to, you know, because if I go there, then I'm going to step out that emotional space. So you're absolutely right, Elspeth. I think you want to be fairly fluent in the details of your story. In a way, that's why, you know, my story is maybe a bit easier to tell because, you know, I know all the details, right? You know, I know, you know, but then again, it's a challenge because I know I need to leave a lot out. But, um, you know, but it's harder to tell when it's, you know, so emotional. So, yeah, I, I, I think you're right. And, I, you know, certainly when I'm doing something that is really uncomfortable for me, I do exactly what you do, which is, you know, you've got to prepare the living daylights out of it. Because if you prepare, it does minimise the fear factor, I think. Um, that's a great way of, you know, otherwise I will truly get anxious about doing something that really does, you know, is, is you know, there is, you know, there's, for some people, storytelling is a really exposing thing, emotional, not just because we're not talking about storytelling here, are we? We're talking about emotional storytelling. We're talking about the very reason why you do what you do. Anybody else? How was that for you? Thanks for sharing, Elspeth. Um, Anybody I, else? I would just jump in. Sorry. Um, so I would agree with Elspeth. Yeah, preparation. Um, yeah. D- depending on which hat I've got on with Inspiring Scotland and <laughs> certainly yeah. approaching corporates, um, emotional, I would say more sort of like engaging. I want them to engage with what we do and what yes. I can do for them. And then the prep bit is, so if it's, do you know, if it's a financial organisation, they're going to have lots of people. If I'm wanting volunteers, so they're going to have lots of people that sit with spreadsheets and do all sorts of boring financial yeah. sort of stuff. I need them. Charities need them. So I tell yeah. them stories about how they they can, yeah. they can get their um, employees volunteering in a meaningful way that's going to help them develop their leadership. It's going to help them work better as a team member. It's going to help the corporate with their, um, you know, with their staff retention because they're offering yeah. such great opportunities. So I make it engaging and I make it tailored as well to I what I think they might be looking. So I am always looking for them to start to almost sort of like appear to not be listening because they're thinking about, oh, that would be great for such and such a person or such and such a person. Absolutely. And then yeah, I offer should... then how they could do it. I make it so easy for them. Yeah, 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 mm-hmm. absolutely. I think I that's great. Think... If you're if you're speaking to a finance company, tell them a story about, a you know, an accountant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, somebody else. Yes, Lena. Say, I'm sorry. Just I suppose what occurred to me and does occur to me is, you know, we're telling these stories, but, you know, we've got a responsibility. These are real stories. Yes. Real people's lives. And you don't want to turn into that kind of mercenary way of saying no. it's, it's a horrendous sob story. That absolutely. We use. Do you know what I mean? It's just you've I got agree. a responsibility there to, to consider it all. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that's, you know, we're, we're you know, we, we know that, you know, you're all professionals and we're all about, you know, being professional about this and just respecting, you know, in reality, if you want to, you know, you can change the name of the person that you're telling the story about. Um, or if you're showing a photo, you don't have to show a photo of them, yeah. you know, only, you know, and make sure, that, yeah. make, make sure that you've got permission. I think you're absolutely right. But Lena, also, let's not go so far that we actually, what can happen is that we then so self-sanitize that we don't even end up telling the stories. You know, yeah. I think if the, these stories, you know, I, I'm working with the charity right now and one of the biggest, you know, penny drop moments in the whole thing is they realize they've not been telling stories. And honestly, their stories are about, you know, children at school and their imaginations and they're to die for. But but yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Tell them respectfully. We're not, you know, we're not trying to be double glazing salespeople here mm-hmm. and say, have I got a story for you that's going to help you 
depart with you know five grand on new new windows no you know i think we're doing it for very ethical reasons but i totally agree with you let's respect the person because the person that we respect that we're talking about is very vulnerable and exactly as i did you know a good bit of practice to do is give your respect your audience as well do give them a trigger warning if it's going to be something that could be very upsetting for somebody you know then give people a bit of a warning out there i i i love you i love your point and in fact lena if you change the name you know you might want to say by the way i've changed the name to respect this person's privacy i think it's not bad practice um yeah. to change the name yeah yeah. lovely and and also make sure you've got permission to share the story i think that's what you're saying i get it lena um anybody else anything else you want to share what you discovered on your call maybe somebody that hasn't had a chance to share so far linda how was that for you yeah i think it's really interesting what kind of taps you in and um, for me it was when people got a wee bit more personal about something that you could identify yeah. with and you immediately yeah. thought yes I'm I'm there I'm with you I know what you're talking about and you're suddenly engaged in the story and you're listening and working your way through it yeah yeah absolutely I think that's a really crucial piece from you know that Linda's saying there and thanks for sharing Linda is you know when we do get a little bit more personal when we do do a bit of you know we know this right the most powerful speakers are people that allow themselves to be a bit vulnerable. So what we're just wanting to do here in this storytelling is just show a bit of vulnerability. I'm not asking you to lose it or break down because I think that's not that's not you know going to serve you or serve your audience. But I think if they see your lip quiver a bit, you know that's where we're wanting to go if possible. Because we're I think Linda, when you see that person feeling emotion. You feel emotion too, right? I think that's it. You know, if I'm going to get that empathy, I need to see that they, ultimately what we're wanting to see is that you care. Great. Anybody else want to make a comment? Anybody else about how that was for you? How was that for you, Jess? Yeah, I think it was really insightful hearing other people's stories. And I think it was good to um, practice telling a story that, um kind of something that I witnessed myself I guess um yeah. it's yeah. more emotional when it's something that you yes um, are impacted by and I think sometimes that's quite hard in the role I'm in now I used to be sort of frontline staff but now yeah. I'm in the sort of corporate team is I don't get to see those kind of scenarios play out firsthand like I used to so it is really important I think for me to find stories where I do feel that personal connection maybe with a young person um or just you know understanding that from somebody that I trust and know really well so I think it's more of a an incentive for me to kind of get onto our academies a bit more and and meet those young people I want to talk about um because I can't sort of I guess tell a story that I don't feel like there is that connection to so I need to really feel the impact um so yeah just some reflections I think for me to take away of of kind of building my own bank of stories that um, yeah. I've been affected by. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, um, for how many other people was Jess talking there? Do you agree with, with what she's saying there? About, you know, you've got to get out, you know, really the stories I want to share are ones where I've seen somebody firsthand, be it either a relative or a family member, or much more likely, you know, exactly as you said, Jess, I've been to see this service. I met this, you know, young person. And now I'm going to share the story of that young person. I've got permission to tell her story and I'm going to change her name. And I'm going to tell you what it was that she told me about her life and what she, she gets from coming to visit our project. You know, so, and I think it's so much more powerful. We somehow feel more authentic, don't we? Than rather, you know, oh, somebody just emailed us over that story and somehow we've got to relate to it. It's impossible because we can't even think about what the room looks like. So, okay, great, folks. So hopefully what today has done for you is inspired you to tell more stories. I think if you're in front of a company, the thing I would say is if you do nothing else, just share with them your story. Exactly as, you know, Sheila mentioned earlier on is, or I think it may have been Sam, is like, you know, if you share a story, it's going to actually nine times out of ten, it's going to create a feeling in that person that's listening that they're going to want to climb over the table and partner with you to help you solve it because it's going to be so emotionally triggering for them. So 
that's what I encourage you to do. So we're going to move on. Unless is, is there any, any questions before we crack on? Sam, are you keen to come in uh, on the last point? I saw you'd unmuted a couple well, of times. I, I was just going to say, um, after we've told our really sad stories <laughs> um, and got more thinking, we tend to end the presentation or the meeting with a, a success story. So a couple of yeah. success stories where the person's been found, but also um, a, a person that had gone missing 50 times Yes. has now done really well for herself and we've got a video of her now um which yeah. we have made and it's just just to end on a positive note if you like that this really can make a difference i agree i think we've got no responsibility to our audience not to leave them you know on the floor you know we need to bring it in have a story that's got an arc or indeed if your story doesn't have that arc then to actually show them what is possible because after all that is the very solution that you're asking them to jump in with you to help you you know your problem at missing people is yes you know how to find the solution because you help people find people or you help people cope with you know missing but also there are lots of people that you're not able to reach at the moment so you want to reach more that's why you need corporate you know partnerships yeah great sam um Great, you know, really uh, great point. Let's not, you know, it isn't, uh, yes, we do need to go into the darkness, but I think we've got to show them that after the darkness, there is, you know, hope. And the hope is the partnership that you're talking to them about. Right. So let me just crack on. I'm just going to finish now with the last point, and then we're going to go into some Q&A. So the last step of the five recommended steps are um, about following up with patient persistence. So once you've got some interest from the company, then what we really recommend you do is you operate this thing that we call patient persistence. So I think it's very important to say that secure, and you know this, right, probably, but I'm going to remind you of it because it's important to emphasize it, is there's no such thing in corporate partnerships as, as low-hanging fruit or quick results. It's you know, that you might get it a little bit, but don't try and rely on it. It's, you know, it's a bit of a myth and it's not going to serve anybody. The reality is that securing corporate partnerships is a marathon, not a sprint. Usually it takes six to 18 months. One of the mistakes that we see charities doing quite a lot at the moment is that they meet with a company once and then they say, after that meeting, I'm going to send you a proposal or would you like me to send you a proposal? And the company says, yeah, okay, yeah, send me a proposal. Then they send it, and then nothing happens after that. Because meeting with a company once and then sending them a proposal is a bit like asking somebody to marry you after a first date. It doesn't work. You know, it's a bit weird. So don't do it, you know, because actually it's going to take, it's going to take longer. This is not a double glazing sale, which is far more transactional. This is something much more sophisticated about us partnering together to create a partnership that actually delivers your commercial goals, our goals, and also creates a better world. So what you're going to need to do is now you've done all this work to do your concept mapping, identify your prospects, go and engage them with an opportunity and share a story, then really what we're going to need to do is stick at it. And the way we encourage you to think about is – Think about the three keys to unlock partnerships. See these as the three key variables to help you secure corporate partnerships. So the first one is about relationships. This is going back to the piece that we're much more likely to buy from people that we know, like, and trust. So this is about you building up the knowing and the liking and the trusting. So in particular, folks, the relationship piece is about that piece that happens in the first five minutes of any call. In the olden days, when we used to meet people face to face, this is what used to happen from the lift to the meeting room and also whilst we're pouring coffee and tea. But now we're on Zoom, we don't do this. So I really recommend for your meetings still, even if it's just a half an hour meeting, still have five minutes at the beginning just to do some small talk. This is the incredible moment where you're going to find out whether they have children or whether where they've just been on holiday or what's the name of their dog or what do they care about, who they support, what's their hobby. And you write this down 
And the next time you jump on a call, you say, so how was Mallorca? You know, how's um, how's um, Stevie doing at reception? You know, so just working out, that's relationship. Emotional engagement, well, we've just been talking all about that. That's particularly through stories, but also by sharing maybe some of the statistics, you know, the problem that you're, you're doing. But you want to maybe make sure each time you meet them, perhaps think about how am I going to emotionally engage them in some shape or form? Or also between meetings, is there a story? Maybe there's a video link I could send over. I just thought, you, you know, I think that Gary's story is one that I think you should really watch, you know, or I just thought of this. Or you might be interested in this quote we got from one of our service users. I just thought I'd send it over. And then lastly, the business case. What you're doing is you're really wanting to understand what are the goals that they have as a business and making sure that your partnership opportunity really does address them. And you're doing that throughout the period of unlocking this partnership. So what you're wanting to do is get each of these, the relationship, the emotional engagement and the business case, all to a 10 out of 10 or near a 10 out of 10. Once you can honestly say that's where they're all at, and folks, I think it's going to be about three or four meetings down the line, three or four meetings, three or four phone calls as well, quite a few emails. Then you could say, right, okay, now I, is it okay? You seem really keen on partnering with us. Can I send you a proposal? That's the moment to send the proposal. It's like when I asked my wife to marry me, I asked her when I was pretty certain that she was going to say yes. Yeah, I mean, she told me what kind of ring she wanted and that I shouldn't buy her a ring, that we'd go and choose it together, blah, 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 right? You know, the time to ask to send a proposal is when you know that it's going to get a yes. Don't try and get the proposal to influence on your own because it's just a written document and that's not going to persuade anybody to partner with you. It's these three. These are the three keys. Another way to see it, a really another great formula is think about 7114. So we encourage you to 7114 your prospect. So what that does is this is based on research from Google on prospecting. And what it says is that somebody will buy from a company once they've had seven hours of dwell time on their content. In other words, they spent seven hours either in meetings with them or perusing their content on the website or reading their stuff or watching their videos or having calls. But basically it's like, look at it, it's seven hours, almost a full day of dwelling because they really do need to get to know you and your why. 11 interactions. So an interaction could be any contact point. So like an email or a phone call or a meeting or they come to your event. And then the last one is four different types of communication. So four different mediums, if you like. So they've watched a video, they've read a report, they've had a meeting with you, and then maybe also they've seen some of your feed on social media. So it's a really great formula. If you are nurturing a prospect right now, what you might want to do is work out if you 7-Eleven forward them. If you have done, they're cooked, they're ready to bring to the boil, then that could be a moment where you could say, you could say, we'll send you a proposal. Or how about if we come and this is what we did with SolarAid and a company called Foresight, we worked out that we'd like eight, 13, 15, you know, seven of them, you know, so we, we were well over seven, eleven, four. So we said, look, we've been talking for quite a while. You're clearly keen to partner. Can we come and make a presentation to your chairman? Because we knew he was the ultimate decision maker. He would sign off. But we knew, and they said, you're right. We could go and talk to him about it, but actually nobody's going to talk to you about it as well as SolarAid does. So that is our recommendations for securing partnerships. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So my overall takeaway from this talk today is three things, which is, one is I recommend that you focus on five-star prospects. Secondly, when you go and engage companies, engage them emotionally by telling a story. And thirdly, follow up with patient persistence. So you do not stop 
but you show patience in your relentlessness. And I think if you go and do that, you will build incredible partnerships that deliver corporates, objectives, your objectives, and help create a better world. Thank you. We've got time for some questions. So I was going to say, Jonathan, is this a Q&A session? Uh, uh, yeah. People are actually welcome to unmute, uh, possibly ra raise your hand, and we'll, we can take questions like that. Uh, and folks are welcome to type a, a message for Jonathan, sorry, a, a question for Jonathan in the chat as well, and we'll pick that up. Um, and we've got quite a bit of time now, folks, so feel free to use it. We can go anywhere that we've been on this content but also we can go anywhere on corporate charity partnerships. It doesn't have to be on the topic of what we've discussed today. So if you've got a burning question, something that's bothering you, or a challenge that you're facing right now, let me know. Sheila, did you have a question? Yes, I was looking for my wee hand button and I can't see it. I'm used to Teams now and I guess... <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to go back to the, you know, the mapping, yeah. um, the contacts mapping. And I just wondered if you had any advice about what group of people it's best to do that with, because I'm now starting to think, oh, should we involve, for example, some of our board members in that? Or should it be staff or should it be? So have you got any advice on what works best or do we do it yeah. a couple of times and see what we I get? think it's. I think it's all, it, it will vary from charity to charity, but I think the most crucial people in your charity will be your trustees and also your um, senior management. But also, like we did some work with uh, Dementia UK and they had some regional ambassadors who were people that had been, you know, either had dementia themselves or they were carers of people with dementia but there are also people who had worked in business. So you might have that third bit, which is almost like volunteers or champions or ambassadors. Um, you know, I know, for example, that, you know, at um, Dyslexia Scotland, you know, you, they, you've got about 60 volunteers, but some of those could be some brilliant ones to um, invite. So um, I think if you can get anything from, you know, I've done it with anything from four to 12. And you're right, you know, Sheila, if they can't all join the first session, you know, one great thing to do can be give them two slots. Say, look, we're going to do this on the 12th of December and the 14th of December, both of them at 9 a.m. Feel free to jump into whichever one. The power of bringing them together, and you probably know this, is about peer pressure. And especially if you've lined up one, like, say, for instance, your chair, you know, this is a great opportunity for the chair to lead by example and the chair to kick us off and say, yeah, I bought these five contacts or I bought seven contacts. I've been at ones where the chair has gone, honestly, I've got so many contacts, I'm going to have to email them through. But that's the kind you want. But, you you know, you're keeping it dead simple. You only need five. So, but, uh, yeah, I, I had one where it was two members of staff and two trustees from a little charity called Stepping Stones. They're a, they're a Down syndrome charity. And they mapped 70 contacts in half an hour. We use a, 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 a great tool to use for this is we use an online tool called Mural. But in truth, you can just do this on a spreadsheet or on a Word doc. We're trying to keep, you know, in truth, you know, you're talking to trustees. Often they're not the most technologically savvy. So keep it super simple for them. Just ping me, a just email me a list in advance. That's all you need to say, Sheila. You know, by this day, email me a list in advance. Yeah. And I'll then bring the big list and we can just highlight some ones we're excited about. Does that help, Sheila? Yeah, no, that, thanks. That's great. Go for the people that you think have got the contacts. I think that's the thing. But also people, some people do have contacts and they don't realise it. The key thing to encourage them to do is get them to trawl through LinkedIn. Yes, Lena. Yeah, I was just going to say, we've been through this. We've done the contact mapping. And yeah. I think one of the points you, that you made earlier, Jonathan, is an important one. You know, I personally and some others, we're, we're a bit reluctant in some cases to share contacts because you kind of think, I know that person, but I don't want my company pestering <laughs> them. 
but I would say don't don't be reluctant to do that yeah. because it, it usually fosters other good ideas um, from our discussions anyway. So, for example, I know Donald McDonald, who's the CEO of McDonald's Hotels. But I wouldn't want, but you know, we, we put him on the list anyway. So it's just saying, don't be, you know, afraid of no, anything. Agree. Any tenuous link as well. We find well, because also remember, as we said earlier on, Lena, you're so spot on with this point. Is remember, as we said earlier on, you're not going to be walking in there asking for money. You're going to, you know, the the approach will be that any company that Dyslexia Scotland approaches, they're going to walk in with an exciting partnership opportunity that is perfect for that company to help them overcome one of their challenges at the moment. So you don't need to be thinking about, oh, yeah, we're going to be putting them out. And that, like you say, they're going to be jumping all over my my contact with no care. Yeah, brilliant point. Anybody else got a question or a challenge or a comment? Something you're wrestling with at the moment, or maybe it could be a it could be a barrier that you're facing at your charity, which is meaning that you're struggling to unlock the corporate opportunity. I'm not seeing any uh, que questions coming through the chat just now, Jonathan, but I'm taking full advantage of my attendance here today as well. I've been taking lots okay. of notes. Um, and I've mentioned to you previously, but I worked many years in fundraising and, you know, corporates is just something that didn't quite crack. But um, I was interested in, you touched on the four different types of communication. And I know that there was always a thought that we needed shiny, glossy materials in order to approach corporates. Now, I know that not all organizations have videos available and they don't have a uh, professionally designed, branded materials. Uh, many of us do, but, you know, these things get outdated as well. I just wondered how you felt or what were your thoughts on how vital materials like that are? Um, does it need to be invested in or? No, I, I don't think it needs to be invested in. I think that, I mean, there's a few answers to that is, you know, I can tell you one story, which is um, about Jade. So Jade was working for a charity called TransAid. They're all about helping um drivers of big vehicles buses and lorries in africa to get them to be safer on their roads so that they avoid loss of life of the drivers other drivers and also their passengers it's an incredible company and so obviously as you might imagine the companies that she wants to partner with are um, delivery companies and transport companies in the uk so what Jade did was Jade identified her number one prospect and she decided that she wanted to go and meet with them. But I said to Jade, what do you know, what could you do that when you meet with him? Because she said, I'm going to meet with him. I'm just meeting with him at a conference. We're just going to meet for a coffee. So it's going to be a busy space. I'm going to struggle to get out my laptop and start doing a presentation, formal presentation to him. I just want to have maybe a discussion talk. So what she did was she did something really creative, but very simple. Was she bought a, you know, a toy truck. And on that toy truck, she typed out some writing, which had their shared purpose on it together. And then she got a little sticker with their logo on it and TransAid's logo on it. And then during the meeting at the right time, she said, and here's my idea. This is what it would look like with our partnership on the side of our trucks, with our shared purpose on the side, saying how it is that together, we believe that every driver should be safe. And, you know, this was Jade's, you know, toy truck trick that landed her one of the biggest partnerships that TransAid's ever had. And what did it cost her? It cost her probably, you know, £14.99 online plus some stickers. So uh, I think companies like it if we, I think they like it if we do stuff that's creative, but also not expensive. I don't think we need to be polished. In fact, I don't think they expect us to be polished. It's good to look a bit, you know, Blue Peter-ish. Yes, Sheila. I'm just going to come in again since, <laughs> since uh, everyone else is quiet. But um, 
I suppose I was a bit worried uh, about over offering though at that stage. And do you have any advice on how you don't get into that? So for example, one of our offers, we have national counselling services, and we've already done this for a few companies where we do some training slots for managers and how to talk about mental health in the workplace, how to have the conversation, how to bring that up. So uh, there's an offer that we've got that could be quite attractive. But how do we do that without then them saying, well, that's great. You can just come in and train all our managers and that'll be lovely. And, and that you know, how do you get to that bit where you've got an exciting, attractive offer? Yeah. yeah. But you well, have a you're, conversation you're... about what do we get back for this? Well, you're a charity, right? So the thing is, they know you're from a charity. So they know that money is one of the things you want to talk about. They know you are short of funds you know they read the papers they watch the news they know that you need money so there's no harm in you offering something but expecting something in return i would say if you're going to go and train their staff i mean if you go and maybe talk to their staff for half an hour i think you could offer that for free that could be your foot in the door mechanic Mm -hmm. but i think if you're going to go and train their people you should charge for that Mm -hmm. and you should charge the kind of money not what it costs you to deliver but what it's worth for them so mm-hmm. that's the important thing what you want to do is not charge them what it costs you to deliver these materials but what it's worth worth for them so for example you might want to think about well what is it worth for us to help them keep on these company you know what would a what would a professional what would a you know business charge them for training you know in truth the business could charge for a one day training you know two and a half thousand pounds well let us go do that then. Mm-hmm. And that would be good money from mm-hmm. child, you know, from training. You know, sometimes it's even more than that. But yeah, yeah, chart. But the other key thing is, and I think what you're saying is, you know, in a way, your question is, when do we bring up money? Because, mm-hmm. you know, honestly, whenever I speak to corporate fundraisers or CEOs, you know, this is the question that every CEO asks. Yeah, but Jonathan, when do I make the ask? Mm-hmm. And I'm saying you don't ever make the ask. You're making the offer. But this is what high net, you know, major donor fundraisers tell us. They have taught me. And what they do is they say, ideally, you wait for them to bring up money. It's a really skillful thing. What you certainly do not do is do not mention it in the first meeting unless they bring it up. Ideally, it's something to bring up at the second meeting, but wait for them to raise it. So they'll kind of go something like, well, Sheila, this all sounds fantastic, but what sort of money are you looking for? Mm-hmm. You know, and then you can say, well, look, you know, um, I can prepare that for you for our next meeting. Make that the thing to discuss. But, you know, one of the great things is, is um, it's really important to think about it, folks. These people that, you know, I, I mean, I think, Gary, you asked this question before we started this session, is you're probably wondering, who do I meet at the company? So the ideal people to meet at companies are what we would call the economic buyer. That's the main person you want to meet. So it's the person that holds the budget. So ideally, in most of the companies you want to meet, you're going to want to meet either the CEO or the marketing director or the HR director. It may depend a little bit on what you've got to do. You know, like, for instance, if it's, you know, training on dealing with grief from crews, well, then it might be actually a conversation with the HR director because that's going to be more of an HR type issue. Um, but go in high. That's one of the things. Um, but also just, you know, really um, just, you know, show them how it is that your partnership is going to, you know, um, you know, deliver benefits for them. And um, I, I think that, and this is the key bit is when you're talking to those very senior business people, it's important to understand that they are of often of a particular personality type. They are quite driven people. They're the kind of people that when they're in a room, they dominate. They are what we would call top dogs type people. And they're very driven and they make up their minds quite fast. But one of the key features of this personality type is these people like to be the person who decides. They like to be the person that makes the final decision. And the CEOs in the room will also recognize that in themselves. If your CEOs in the room, you're probably the person that likes to decide. 
So if you've got somebody who likes to make the final decision, how do you cope with that from a corporate partnership's point of view? What can you offer to them? Any thoughts, folks? Sheila or anybody else? How do you deal with somebody like that? The person that likes to be the one who decides. I suppose maybe appealing to them emotionally or trying to make that connection with them. It <laughs> is that. But what I'm really it. dealing with more is about give them options. So companies and we as people, we like options. So a great thing to do maybe at meeting three might be, look, based on the conversations we've had so far, I'm going to come back to you with some options. And then they can decide. We did this in a meeting with a big coffee company, one of the world's biggest coffee companies, right? We did it and we take them three ideas. And the director of sustainability, she said, I love that one. So, well, well, that's going to be the one we're going to go with then. It's great because also it meant that because we had one, one idea that she thought was a bit average, that's great. So it's great to give people options. And three is a very great, is a really good number to give people the choice of. Just somehow we like stuff in threes, more behavioral science. Does that help you, Sheila? Yeah. Try not to, don't, don't bring up money, but do make sure, and, and also make sure you ask, you know, when you do eventually put a price on it, and I think it is you're putting a price on it, do make sure, you know, and a great trick to do is, you can even go through and just work out what's the value of all the stuff you're offering. We did this with a charity, um, maternal mental health charity, and they worked out that the value they were offering this company was, was in the region of about a million pounds. So they said, we need to make this a million pound partnership. And the company went, went all right, then let's do it. And the companies are not scared of the million figure. It's us that are. We've had a question in chat, Jonathan. Uh, okay. Sam has asked, do you think it's okay to go with ideas and not to let them have their own ideas for a campaign? So I think, uh, Sam, are you asking that, uh, is it okay to go with them with a clearly defined campaign? So they would have little, the company themselves would have little influence over... Well, I, I think that's the crucial point. I think it goes back to the point I've just made earlier. Great question, Sam. Because that's where we tend to go a little bit when we're in charities, is we've already got an idea of what we want to do, and we just want somebody to fund it. That's what we're told as fundraisers. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the conversation, Jess. But in truth, yeah, I get, you know, but in truth, we just need somebody to fund it. And so, um, but actually what really works for companies is, remember, the people you're influencing – they are clever people and also they like to be the one who decides. So what really works is to take them a bit of a broad idea, take them a rough idea, but be willing to be prepared for the fact that it could totally change. Because after all, you're engaging them for their full skill and capability. And, and we all know this, right? Anybody who's got kids or anybody who's got anybody you want to influence in your lives, people are much more likely to go with an idea that they think is their idea. Even if in the whole thing of it, they end up saying, this is my idea, even though you know it was your idea in the first place. You know, lose your ego. Be happy for them to realise, think it's their idea. So, yeah, I think what really works is we recommend you walk in in the first meeting with three pieces of activity you could do. But have them just as outline concepts, um, giving an indication of the kind of creativity that you'll bring to the table. But knowing that the stuff that you share in your first meeting is highly unlikely to be what you decide to go with in the end. Because they're going to probably best be able to tell you what it is that they can do to help you. So I think I would, you know, Sam, in answer to your question, leave it loose. Leave it room for them to come in and make it their own too. Is there any more questions or anything else anybody wanted to raise? Jonathan's been wonderful in all organizing all of this with us and he's a t t terribly open book. So if there's any questions you're very curious about, about the world of corporate. I've partners. got I've got a I've got a suggested session to finish up on. So we can finish with a closing exercise. So folks, what I want you to do now in chat, I want you to do three things. So in chat, I want you to write. 
as a result of the session today, what's one thing I'm going to stop doing? As a result of the session today, what's one thing I'm going to start doing? And as a result of today, one thing that I'm going to do tomorrow. So stop, start tomorrow. If you could all just do that in chat now, that would be really great. So what's one thing you're going to stop doing? You don't need to do the whole as a result of today bit. Just say, I'm going to stop this, start this, and tomorrow I'm going to do this. If you could share those, it would be really great. And then what we'll do is we'll just, we'll ask one or two people just to share in a moment. Lovely share, Sheila. Great, Lena. It is time to stop underselling. For the whole sector. Lovely. Nice one, Jess. Stop assuming they're going to happen quickly. I bet you if somebody asked you to marry them on the first date, you would decide not to see them again, Jess. Absolutely. It's called jumping the gun. It's also not a bit creepy when they tell you they love you on their first date. Not that anybody's ever done that to me. Don't do that either. Great one, Kim. Right. Let's share some of these folks around the room. So um, let's do with some, I'm going to just pick people if that's okay. So be ready to unmute. Sheila, give me your stop. I'm going to stop thinking that it's too big a problem for us to crack in terms of working with corporates and we need yeah. to go for it. I'm going to stop thinking it's overwhelming. I'm just going yeah. to break it down to, into these. That's the power of breaking it down into these five simple steps. Just start by organising a contact mapping. Lena, what's your stop? Um, yeah, underselling ourselves. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really, it's sometimes really difficult because you're artist in your own world and you're trying to do your job day to day and just do the things that you need to do. And you sometimes think... What can we possibly offer people where it is quite obvious maybe but yes it's a wee bit about the energy to do it as well because we're all so busy I agree. sometimes you think this is another thing and it feels massive um and, yeah. it, and it could also invite a lot more work <laughs> which is a wee bit scary as well at times absolutely but then again that's the reason to price it up properly if it's mm -hmm. going to invite a lot more work then give yourself the resources to be able to pay those trainers properly and, you know, pay maybe an administrator to help you administrate it. Richard, what's your stop? I'm wondering if it's possible to have a corporate partnership. <laughs> yeah, you're going to stop wondering. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Love that, Richard. Scott, what's your stop? Um, my stop will be to just stop getting in touch with corporates just when we have a specific appeal to ask for money, but thinking long-term. Yeah. So really think long-term. Yeah. Play that long game. Great. Okay. From Christine onwards, we're going to move on to start. So Christine, what's your start? I think just to start thinking about ways um, corporate organisations can maybe help us beyond to stop just thinking about the funding and actually think yeah. about other things. So maybe attracting volunteers could be. I love uh, that. And ask. Chris for Christine, that's so powerful because you can then start treating companies like their companies rather than bank accounts. Missing people told me that basically when they partnered with Royal Mail, Royal Mail partnered with them because missing people went in and said, look, You've got all these posties out there with these electronic handsets. If somebody went missing, could we send them a picture of somebody that's gone missing and they could be our eyes and ears in the community? And Royal Man went and said, we flipping love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do that. And they set off a partnership in that regard. 
And they started finding people. And they've been partnering together for years. It's well over 10 years, that partnership. In fact, Gary became, from, Mrs. from Royal Mail, became one of their trustees. And now they give them money every year. But Gary said, there's no way we'd have started that partnership if the first thing out of their mouths was, can you give us some money, please? Yeah, brilliant. Christine, love that. Char no, not Charlie. We're not going to do you because you're from Cora. But I love it. We can always talk about it later. Elspeth, what thing you're going to start? Oh, yeah. um, for me, it's bigger picture, thinking a little bit um, outside the box and yeah. looking at how so things don't get lost in translation. So kind of trying to find some of those those things a bit better so that the crossover there, like you know, the image you showed before, that I can define that better and really show them um, Absolutely. how people work together. Yeah, that doesn't get lost in translation there. Um, it's a bit of a theme, I think, out of today's session is about thinking a bit differently, giving yourself more time to prepare, and thinking big, Elspeth, you know, you could, you know, maybe think about that partnership that is going to scare the living daylights out of you a little bit, but still go and pitch for that too. Um, Gary, what's one thing you're going to start? I think the same as most people, it's identifying what our charity can do that provides opportunity for corporates. Yes. What, yeah. what can we offer? Tangible. And I think, yeah, if you can really get in touch with that, and see what a great catch you are, how valuable you are, then you'll be coming from a place of massive confidence, Gary. Yeah. Great. It's all about value, this. This is value selling, right? Yep. But targeted at a specific problem. Don't try and solve multiple problems. Just focus in on one that you know is there. You know, so part of it is be a pain detective. Find their pain and sell into that. Donna, what's your start? Um, well, we I've just been thinking about the fact that we have so many stories, uh, so many yeah. about yeah. Our, own, our whole organisation and maybe um, uh, adapting them a little bit more to that format that you were talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Um, because yeah. we, know, we, you know, we we also have quite a bit of training that we could provide to companies yeah. in yeah. terms of supporting their employees and, and particularly parent carers within those organizations. Brilliant. So that might be the link. That's the connection. Both, both of those. Things. Those are great. Definitely go for those. Right. We're going to need to wrap up. So I'm going to go quickly through the remainder with your tomorrows. So Elaine, what's your tomorrow? Super fast. Um, so I have to go, but um, my yeah. thing would be um, to share some of my contacts that I have through my volunteer Perfect. network with um, the senior management team. But it's a wee bit difficult because I've got a relationship and it's all to do with non-financial stuff, so it would need to be carefully developed. But yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I do share, but I could probably share more. Well, I'm happy to talk to you more about that if you want, Elaine. Yes. Great. Judy, Thanks so much, Judy, Rosa. Sorry, I have you're welcome. Time. No worries. I'm going to wrap up super fast now. Judy, what's your tomorrow? Um, definitely the mapping. I think with um, with the rest of uh, my colleagues, it's a great idea at our team meeting. Perfect. Well done, Judy. Alicia, what's your tomorrow? Um, very similar to Donna's. Um, start um, looking at the stories and kind of developing them amazing yeah they're going to need a bit of work maybe to tell them in this format jess um mine is re-engage with a prospective new partner so just have a bit of a brainstorm looking at what i've learned today about how to do that not just cold email and you know think about how i want to approach that yeah perfect well done jess think about what you could offer them what opportunity based on shared purpose louise What's your tomorrow? Yeah, I, I think it's a sh share with the, with the rest of the team and, and make a plan. <laughs> See what yeah. we can do. Yeah, absolutely. Let's just make a plan and just see how it goes. You know, we might fall flat on our nose, but at least we'll have tried and we'll learn along the way. But just go for it. Absolutely, Louise. Yeah, yeah kid. I... Sorry, Louise. Louise, I've just got to march on. Kim. 
Um, mine is to follow up, make a phone call with a company that I've already had a face to face meeting with, but then yeah. kind of gone a little bit quiet on us to to kind of try a different communication method other than email. I'm just going to get brilliant. It. Well done, Kim and Sam. What's your tomorrow? Um, I actually like the truck with the sticker. Um, yeah, and something I wanted to do some sort of merchandise idea. Um, so I'm going to try and look into that and expand that idea a bit. Yeah, create a mock-up of what it, it of what it would look like. Yeah, that's it. Then, then they can touch it and feel it. Yeah, and and see, and see it because if you can see it, you can be it, right? Yeah, and also a thirty minute meeting with my trustees because they 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 don't. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Brilliant. Okay, folks. Thank you thank for you. all your time. Thanks for your thank stop, you, stop starts and, and tomorrows. And um, thanks to Cora Foundation.